Thanks to Skillshare for keeping Legal Eagle in the air. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking the link in the doobly-doo. I'm trying to be cool about this, but you can't just rip people's music off. It's against the law. I am above the law! <laughs> a record company above the law? I've never heard anything like that. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. And today we are covering the episode of South Park that gave rise to the Chewbacca defense. This is probably one of the most quoted things by lawyers in the entire world. And it's great to go back and see the genesis of the Chewbacca defense because my friends and I use it all the time. Why would a Wookiee, an eight foot tall Wookiee, want to live on Endor with a bunch of two foot tall Ewoks? That does not make sense. As always, be sure to comment in the form of an objection, which I'll either sustain or overrule, and stick around until the end of the video where I give the South Park Chef A Chewbacca Defense episode a grade for legal realism. So, without further ado, let's dig in to South Park Chef Aid. <laughs> okay, so the background here is that Chef wrote a song called... called Stinky Britches. What did you say? He's saying some new hit song. I wrote that song 20 years ago. And now it's being covered by major rock artists, including Alanis Morissette. Stanky, stanky bridges. Stanky bridges. So because he wrote the song, he goes to the record company to ask that he be credited for having written the song. He actually doesn't ask for monetary compensation. He just wants a credit for having written the song. <sighs> stinky britches. Stinky bitches, you got those stinky bitches. So you see, stinky Mr. Big bitches, Record Producer, Stinky Bitches was something I wrote several years ago. Hmm, I really see no resemblance between that song and Stinky Bitches by our artist Alanis Morissette. <laughs> huh? It's the same song! I don't think that's the kind of song that Alanis Morissette would write. Also, I don't know how people are able to determine that this is the same song given just the two seconds of the song that they're playing and that it shares just really this this lyric. I mean, presumably this song is exactly the same, so I think we can we can understand that it is supposed to be the same song, but understand that in the real world, just because the same lyric is in multiple songs does not necessarily mean that copyright infringement has occurred. I'm trying to be cool about this, but you can't just rip people's music off. It's against the law. I am above the law. <laughs> a record company above the law? I've never heard anything like that. Mr. Chef, I'm afraid you leave me no alternative. We're going to sue you. Sue me? You stole one of my songs, and you're going to sue me? Yes. I suggest you get a real good lawyer. We'll have the best in the business. We'll get my dad to be Chef's lawyer. Yeah, and he's Jewish. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so that might sound insane, that someone wrote a song that a music label then copied that song and the music label sues the person who originally wrote the song. There is actually a real mechanism in real life that would allow that to happen. There's something called declaratory relief that allows someone that once a controversy has occurred to then go to court and while they are effectively the plaintiff, really what they're doing is saying, I'm worried that this other person is going to sue me or that there is some controversy that needs to be adjudicated. And as a result, I'm going to take the affirmative step of filing suit and just adjudicating this thing. So while it might seem crazy, Crazy that the the victim could be the defendant in a lawsuit like this, it's actually totally plausible that the music company might be so worried about this lawsuit that they take the affirmative step of filing suit against Chef. And the mechanism that they would be using is called declaratory relief. So it actually could happen. Stanky, stanky bridges. Stanky bridges. You know, I actually don't think that that Alanis Morissette's Stinky Britches song sounds like the one that Chef sang uh, earlier on in this episode. Stinky Britches, you got those stinky Britches! Of course, we've seen in the news recently that there have been some major copyright infringement actions between songs that I don't think sound anything like each other, and frankly, I think the jury's got it wrong. For example, we saw in the Blurred Lines Marvin Gaye lawsuit and the Katy Perry Dark Horse lawsuit, both of which the juries found for the plaintiff, I don't think that there is a really good reason why that should count as copyright infringement. I've been meaning to do a video on this, but in the meantime, check out Adam Neely's videos on these subjects. He's done a really good job of breaking down the lawsuits from a music theory perspective. And I think my hunch is right that these lawsuits should not have held for the plaintiff, let alone penalize the defendants by millions of dollars. 
Now just let me do all the talking, Chef. We're gonna bring these down. Right. This court is now in session. Who is representing the defense? I am, Your Honor, Gerald Broslovsky. And representing the prosecution? I am, Your Honor, Johnny Cochran. <gasps> uh-oh. Why uh-oh? Chef, that's Johnny Cochran. He, he's the guy that got OJ off. Uh-oh. All right, so for the younger viewers out there, that is true, that there was a famous lawyer named Johnny Cochran who was the lead counsel in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. O.J. Simpson, for those of you that don't remember, was a star football player and was uh, alleged to have murdered his wife and his wife's lover. Famously, O.J. Simpson had many different lawyers, but the most famous and lead counsel was Johnny Cochran, who was well known for coming up with phrases that would be repeated throughout the trial. When I covered the Seinfeld finale that involved a trial, they also created parody of Johnny Cochran, whose name was Jackie Childs, who exhibited similar flamboyance in court. I am shocked and chagrined. I think we're gonna see a lot of some parodies of uh, Johnny Cochran in this South Park trial. And so on this 15th day of what is considered to be the most important trial of the day, Johnny Cochran has appeared to defend capitalist records. The question now is, Will Cochran use his famous Chewbacca defense? So, uh, famously, for some reason, the O.J. Simpson trial, they allowed cameras inside of the courtroom, and it just turned into this phenomenon that the entire nation was obsessed with. I actually remember in middle school, I think, we stopped classes, we rolled in a TV into the classroom, and we watched the verdict being read because we knew it was going to be a historical event. And as a result, the news coverage about the O.J. Simpson trial and of course the chef trial in this particular case were just insane and there were cameras and talking heads. It was really sort of the beginning of the cable news sort of punditry that we see today. What's a Chewbacca defense? I don't know. That's what Cochran used in the O.J. Simpson trial. I hate that Cochran guy. If he was here in front of me, I'd be like, hey, you stupid son of a you didn't, I'm gonna kick you in the nuts. I'm sure that would scare the hell out of him, Cartman. Yeah, so uh, what Cartman has done here is a pretty good parody of what I see all the time on Twitter, which is people who don't have a law degree or any experience in the legal profession second-guessing seasoned professionals. And so, in summation, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Oh, okay, we're already in summation for some reason. Apparently, the trial was the next day, and uh, we're starting with closing arguments instead of actually going through the trial and there is no discovery. This kind of trial would take conservatively two years to get to trial, if it even got to trial. And 99% of cases do not even get to trial. They settle or they are dismissed early on and they come nowhere near the actual courtroom or a jury. So this is very, very wrong, very wrong. You've heard the version of my client's song recorded over 20 years ago. You've heard the exact same song produced by these cheats in the past month. I'd say it's pretty much an open and shut case. Make the right decision. Thank you. And, you know, if you had a very strong case and you really thought that the two songs sounded identical to each other, there's no reason that your closing argument needs to be particularly fancy. You could just play them back to back or next to each other and that might be very persuasive evidence. But again, if you had a very strong case, it's very unlikely to get to trial. That's actually one thing that people often forget about trials is that only marginal cases go to trial. And that's both on a civil level and a criminal level because it has to be a really close call. Otherwise it would not get to that point in the judicial system. So when you have an open and shut case, it's gonna be dealt with long before you ever get to trial. Mr. Johnny Cochran, your closing arguments. Ladies and gentlemen of the supposed jury. <laughs> the supposed Johnny jury. I certainly want you to believe that his client wrote Stinky Britches 10 years ago, and they make a good case. Hell, I almost felt pity myself. But ladies and gentlemen of this supposed jury, I have one final thing I want you to consider. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Chewbacca. <laughs> Chewbacca is a Wookiee from the planet Kishik, but Chewbacca lives on a planet Endor. It's true. Now think about that. That does not make sense. Damn it. What? He's using the Chewbacca defense. So this is a parody of Johnny Cochran's famous saying during the O.J. Simpson trial. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. 
Now, in the actual O.J. Simpson trial, there was a bloody glove found at the crime scene. Both the prosecution and defense made a very big deal about this particular bloody glove. And in one of the biggest blunders of all time as prosecutors, the prosecutors had O.J. Simpson take the stand, even though he was taking the fifth uh, as to everything else, and they had him try on the glove. Now, they gave him plenty of forewarning to know that he was going to be asked to put it on, and he wore a latex glove underneath the leather glove as he was trying to try it on. So he had time to, you know, bulk up his hand and he had to, the ability to sort of spread out his fingers and he was wearing a latex glove to, so as to not contaminate it. And for all of those reasons, the defense said that the glove didn't fit OJ Simpson. And so the defense made a huge deal out of this in the closing argument. And people make fun of Johnny Cochran for this childish saying that if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. But the thing is, it sticks with you. Even now, 20 years later, we're still talking about this particular defense. And it stuck with the jury too. I think it's actually a stroke of brilliance that uh, Johnny Cochran was able to capitalize on this bad fact that the prosecution misplayed their hand, no pun intended. And lo and behold, the jury did in fact find that O.J. Simpson to be not guilty. So that is the underlying real life thing that actually happened that gave rise to this parody version of the Chewbacca defense. Why would a Wookiee, an eight foot tall Wookiee, want to live on Endor with a bunch of two foot tall Ewoks? That does not make sense. But more importantly, <laughs> you have to ask yourself, what does this have to do with this case? Nothing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it has nothing to do with this case. It does not make sense. Look at me, I'm a lawyer defending a major record company and I'm talking about Chewbacca. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am not making any sense. None of this makes sense. And so you have to remember, when you're in that jury room deliberating and conjugating the Emancipation Proclamation, does it make sense? <laughs> no. Ladies and gentlemen of this supposed jury, it does not make sense. If Chewbacca lives on Endor, you must acquit. Okay, so there are a lot of problems with this particular theme uh, and this this parody of the, the O.J. Simpson glove defense. Uh, number one, uh, Chewbacca, I think, was on Endor for, you know, like, the Battle of Endor, and I don't know that he actually lives on Endor. He, you know, goes around the galaxy with Han Solo. So I'm not even sure it's accurate to say that Chewbacca actually lives on Endor. He's from Kishek, obviously. But let's put that aside and let's focus on the actual legal issues and not the Star Wars implications. I'm sure I'm gonna get tons of comments about how I don't even understand the Star Wars extended universe. This is just non sequitur after non sequitur. It's literally trying to take uh, something that doesn't make sense and saying for no reason whatsoever that if that doesn't make sense, that this jury should not find in favor of uh, Chef. The defense rests. Okay then. <laughs> So yeah, even the judge recognizes that it's total gibberish and makes no sense whatsoever. And just because it doesn't make sense, that doesn't actually give a reason for why the jury should find for the plaintiff in this particular case. But that being said, it has made a huge mark on uh, lawyers in general. My friends and I will often say we are using the Chewbacca defense or that opposing counsel is using the Chewbacca defense when they're doing something that doesn't make any sense at all. Doesn't really work. Judges don't like it. Juries don't believe it, and uh, doesn't doesn't work out the way you think it would. I'll find you the jury. We find the defendant, Jerome Chef McElroy, guilty as charged. <gasps> And that doesn't even make any sense because this is a civil case. This is a civil case for declaratory relief. It's not even a criminal case where you could find someone guilty. You can't find someone guilty in a civil case. You would have to have a criminal case for that. Mr. Chef, you've been found guilty of harassing a major record label. Harassing. The full fee of $2 million will be handed over within 24 hours. Do I look like I have $2 million? Well, you have 24 hours to find it, or else you'll have to go to jail for 8 million years. <laughs> also not a thing. Yeah, okay, so a number of things are very wrong here. Uh, number one, uh, you can't sentence someone to go to jail in a civil case. You can't find them guilty in a civil case. What Chef was doing was in no way harassment and wouldn't even be grounds for anything like that. On top of that, you wouldn't be given a choice between going to jail and paying a huge fine, even if 
it was a criminal case. And frankly, this is probably one of the biggest issues in civil law is that if there was a judgment for $2 million against some poor individual who's just a chef at a, a local school, they're not gonna be able to pay that. So they'd effectively be judgment proof and they'd just file for bankruptcy and discharge the, the debt that is owed. And that chair too, I want that chair. Hey, that's my favorite chair. You heard the judge, since he lost the case, I can seize whatever I want to pay my legal fees. Yeah, take that water cooler too. So while this timeline is totally unrealistic, what is actually realistic is sometimes if you have a judgment in court, you can use that to get all of the things of the person who the debt is against, or you can get a wage garnishment so that if they have a salary, you can get a percentage, sometimes a very high percentage, of that salary in order to pay back the debt that is owed. And in order to get the court to sign off on turning over physical property, you would need something called a writ of attachment, which is something that would happen in the months after the trial, saying that you are owed this judgment and the only way to get it is to uh, basically take the physical possessions of the defendant or the plaintiff in this case. The funny thing is, if you're able to get a writ of attachment, you get the sheriff of the, the city or the municipality to enforce it. So law enforcement will actually go to the house of the person against whom you have a judgment and they will help you take all of the things and make sure that the, uh, the person is not trying to stop you. So presumably in this particular case, there would have been a writ of attachment and the physical goods would have been sold to discharge the debt. It's a real thing. Ladies and gentlemen of this supposed you must now decide whether or not to reverse the decision for my client, Chef. I know he seems guilty, but ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is Chewbacca. Okay, hold on. Before Johnny Cochran gets into the second Chewbacca defense, let's think like a lawyer. There's no such thing as a jury reversing the decision of another jury. There's a principle in the law called race judicata that says once a case is determined, that's it, it's done. And in the, the case of a, of a jury trial, you might be able to get the appeals court to weigh in and say that there was some defect from a legal perspective, but you would never be able to get a second jury on exactly the same factual matter to render another factual decision. That's absolutely not allowed at all. Uh, once the facts are settled, uh, they're settled. Now think about that for one minute. That does not make sense. Why am I talking about Chewbacca when a man's life is on the line? Why? I'll tell you why. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. If Chewbacca does not make sense, you must acquit. Here, look at the monkey. Look at the silly monkey. Oh, uh, it's, it's totally unrealistic, but it's really funny. Look, look at, at the, the silly, silly monkey. monkey. All right, now it's time to give the South Park Chewbacca Defense episode a grade for legal realism. On the one hand, this episode sort of hints at things that you don't really see in legal dramas very much, like writs of attachment and declaratory relief where a defendant sues a plaintiff. That's really cool. That doesn't happen very often. And the Chewbacca defense has been adopted by lawyers everywhere. We use it all the time. On the other hand is basically everything else. The timing is all screwed up. The second trial makes no sense at all. The legal arguments are intentionally insane. So I'm gonna have to give this episode of South Park a C minus for legal accuracy. It really needs to go back to South Park High. You did, I, I'm gonna kick you in the nuts. Now you can only get sued by the music industry if you have a song first. So if you want to learn how to make your own hit song that will be covered by Alanis Morissette and then be subject to a multi-million dollar lawsuit, you'll first need to learn how to mix and produce your own songs. To do that, I'd recommend Young Guru's Skillshare course, Learn How to Mix Music with DJ Young Guru. He covers everything you could possibly want to know about making music, including organizing the mix, tweaking the levels, and adding effects. He can't keep you from getting sued by Capitalist Records, but he can help you make a diss track sound awesome, 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 awesome. Insane. Wow, he's good. Skillshare is an online learning community that has nearly 30,000 classes on everything, like music, design, technology, and business. Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare when you click on the link below. Plus, it really helps out the channel. The free premium membership gives you unlimited access to must-know topics so you can improve your skills and learn new things. All free for two months. So take Young Guru's Skillshare class and start making your own uh, stinky britches. 
Do you agree with my grade? Leave your objections in the comments and check out my other real lawyer reactions over here where I will see you in court.